Okay, who's going to give me the key to start? The Q. To start. I'm Deacon Kerry Chambers, and I want to welcome you to Tuesday night Bible study. Before we introduce our teacher tonight, there's a few housekeeping things that I want to share with you. This month is Holy Harvest Month. We normally have our booklets located in the North Desk, but since our church is closed, you can individuals can download our book booklets at the church website at www.holmanstreet.org by clicking on the media and resource tab and by selecting Holy Harvest Meditation 2020. For those of you who cannot download the, the um, booklet, uh, senior citizens or, or others, you can call the church at 713-741-8451, and they will print a booklet for you. Now, when you call in, only ask for the booklet for you or someone in your family because there are a limited number of booklets. And when you call in, give your name and your number, and they will call you back when the booklets are ready. Now, the deacons have decided this month that since there is so much going on with the coronavirus and so many other things going on in the world that we will keep our televisions on this month. The televisions will remain on. Now, as I bring forth our teacher for the night, let me tell you about him. He's a good friend of mine. He's a man that has heart for ministry. He loves ministry, he loves mission. He has his Turning Hearts ministry. He has taken his ministry down in South America to multiple countries in South America. He has reached souls all across the, this northern hemisphere. In addition to that, he has a heart for children and for teaching children new things. He has a STEM ministry at his church. He has a building for his STEM ministry only. And he reaches out to young people during the summer times and throughout the rest of the year, and they have contests, and, and uh, they build robotics at his church. And these are only some of the things that he are doing, he's doing. Other than being a dynamic and explosive speaker, he is an exciting preacher and pastor. And I bring to you, who will soon be doctor as PhD, Pastor Matthew Davis of the New Beginnings Church. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Chambers, to to the women and the men of the Holman Street thank, Church, thank you again for, for allowing me to, to come this way. 
Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord, that we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your word. Bless us, Father God, as we dive into your word, that your word will speak clearly to us and that we will understand your word. Lord, we ask you, Father, to forgive us for our sins and bless us, Father God, to be about your business. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Again, Homer Street, thank you so much for, for this privilege, this opportunity. Again, we're going to look at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. The verses are 14 and 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. In keeping with your Holy Harvest Month, uh, I chose some of your scriptures from that you will be representing during the whole Harvest period. Second Chronicles in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verses 14 and 15. When you found it, you will discover these words. If my people, which are called by my name, should humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayers that were made in this place. I want to talk about God's prescription for healing. God's prescription for healing. As we look at the world in which we live, we understand that we are bombarding upon some days that first of all are undesirable days. They are days where we find ourselves not only in a civil war, but we're in a war all around us. We're reminded, we're reminded that this nation, this world needs a healing. We have wars and rumors of wars, as Paul has promised us in Timothy. We have men who are heavy and high-minded. They are more concerned about themselves than they are concerned about God. They think more of the creature than they think of the creator. We found ourselves in a mess, and the first thing I want to point out tonight is, it's because of our rebellion. It is because, it is because of the rebellion of the country, the rebellion of the nation that we find ourselves in the situation that we're in now, and we need a prescription to heal this nation. When we look at the text, we must understand that many have said that this is a, a very familiar text, one that men, women, boys, and girls can quote and recite all over the world. But let us not look at just that one verse in verse number 14 of Second Chronicles 7, but this particular passage, this particular scenery began back in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. When you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 5, you will find that Solomon has brought in all the furnishing into this new temple, this temple that Solomon has built unto the Lord. He brings it into this temple and I talked to you last week about the three areas of church, the three things we call church. The building called church, the people who are the church, and then the atmosphere, which is the church. And we will see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Verse number 13 says that it came to pass when the trumpeteers, the singers, we're on one accord. What would church be like if we all was on one accord? 
what would God do with us if we all were on one accord? What would God do for us? What would God do through us if we could all be on one accord? The text declares that the trumpeters and the singers were on one accord, and they were making one sound. What if we were all on one accord and we all said the same thing? We all sung the same thing? We all believed the same thing? And we all made one sound. The text says in 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13, that the trumpeters, the singers, were on one accord, they made one sound, and they were to be heard praising and thanking the Lord. So here you see the picture. They're all on, on one accord. They're all one that's making one sound, and they are saying and singing the same thing. You know, it, it, would be, it would be terrifying, it would be horrifying if you have a few people in the pews who decide to sing their own song on Sunday while the choir, the praise team is singing praises unto the Lord, they are singing something else. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 5 verse 13 that they were all on one accord, they were all having one sound, and they were praising and thanking God, thanking the Lord. And they lifted up their voices. That's why in church, that's why in church we ought to come into church to lift up our voices. You see, church is not a place where you can fold your hands and and relax and say, I made it and I've done another good day. Church is a place where you ought to lift your voice. And when you lift your voice, you ought to be lifting your voice unto the Lord, praising him and thanking him. It says that they were lifting up their voices and the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and they praised the Lord. You see, the Lord was the object of their affection. The Lord was the object of their praise, and the Lord was the object of their thanksgiving. We ought to thank people. We ought to be kind enough to thank people when people do something for us. But we ought not forget to thank the Lord. So they were all on one accord. They were all singing the same thing. They were all making one sound. They were all praising and thanking the Lord, and they lift up their voices. And they were lifting up their music, the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music. They were praising the Lord. If you have not taken time today, now is a good time to just praise the Lord. If you didn't wake up this morning and before your feet hit the floor, you need to make sure you take a moment to say, Lord, I thank you for another day. Somebody laid down last night and didn't get up this morning. Somebody went to lay down last night and they couldn't lay down on their own and then didn't get up this morning. Somebody got up this morning and they did not walk around like you and I have and they haven't made it to 6 o'clock this evening. They were out of here. So if anybody going to make a sound, we ought to be making the same sound on one accord, praising and thanking the Lord, lifting up our voices with the trumpets and cymbals and also the instruments of music. We ought to praise the Lord. The writer goes on to say that, for he is good. So he tells us who we ought to praise, that is the Lord. Then he tells us why we ought to praise. Number one reason why we ought to praise, for he is good. The Lord is good. You may think that, that she is good. You may say that he is good. You may say they are good. But the fact of the matter is, the Lord is good. Not only is he good, he is merciful, for his mercy 
endureth forever. Now they are coming into this new temple and, and they are dedicating this new temple to the Lord. And as they dedicating the new temple to the Lord, they are excited about it. They are emotional about it. They are spiritually giving themselves up to the Lord for the Lord is good. For the Lord's mercy endureth forever. His mercy is when you deserve to be cut off and God allows you to keep on living. His mercy is when you deserve what is bad, but God gives you what is good. His mercy not only exists right now, but God is such a merciful God until he, he is merciful forever and ever and ever. The author goes on to say, not only is his mercy enduring forever, and then the house was filled with smoke. I'm talking about a prescription for the healing. We, our nation need to be healed. Our nation need to be delivered. Our world need to be healed. And these people on this day, the Israelites knew very well the right prescription for healing. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, chapter number 5, verse number 13, that they sang, said, the Lord is good, his mercy endureth forever. And then all of a sudden the house was filled with smoke, even the house of the Lord. It was filled with a cloud. It was filled with the glory of God. Wouldn't it be something, wouldn't it be something if we were all on one accord? If we all sang and played our instruments and we all made one sound? If we were all in agreement, if we were all praising and thanking the Lord for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and even when we played the music, it wasn't for a show, it was because God is good. And because his mercy is everlasting, wouldn't it be good to know that? The Bible says his glory, his cloud, filled the room, filled the house, even the house of the Lord. So God's presence was there. God's presence was there. The God we know, the holy God himself was there. Verse number 14 of, of 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 14 says, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Can you see it? We get so into God and not into ourselves. We get so in tune to what God is, who God is, what God, not even thinking about what God has done, but just thinking about who God is, is enough for us to rejoice, is enough for us to get on one accord. Somebody tonight needs to know that God is calling you to be on one accord. And as they sang and they praised him and they gave thanks to him, the cloud filled the room and it was so thick in there, the cloud dominated in such a way until the ministers, the preachers, the priests could not minister by reason of the cloud. That's, that's good news when, when we serve the Lord, we worship him and and we worship him to the fact that we are on one accord and, and the, the glory of God fills the room. The text says that for the glory of the Lord fills the room, even the house of the Lord. And let me tell you, if we get together as a church and we get on one accord, God will show himself. He's already here because he is the omnipresent God. He is everywhere. He is all places at the same time. He is a God that is omnipresent, meaning he is all present. He is God. But we just rejoice because God shows himself, reveals himself, manifests himself in our presence. And I want to tell you, he's here tonight. And we are, we are looking, we are examining, we are observing, we are trying to find and looking for him to show himself to reveal himself. When we go to church, we ought to be looking for the Lord to reveal himself. 
not him, not her, not them. We ought to look for the glory of the Lord to reveal himself. So the glory of the Lord filled the room, and the cloud was of such that the preacher couldn't minister. In our vernacular, we would say that the preacher couldn't preach because the glory of the Lord was present in the house. So that day, they had the church there. The body of Christ was there. They had met at the temple, the house that, that Solomon had built that was there where God would put his name. And not only that, they had some church that day. <laughs> they sure enough, this is a good example of how we ought to have church. We, we ought to have church without gossip. We ought to have church without troublemaking. We ought to have church because we are on one accord giving glory to God. And then in chapter 6 of Second Chronicles, Solomon began to pray for the people because the people were a rebellious people. And in his prayer, he lets us know that rebellion brings about some things. Rebellion brings about chaos. Rebellion brings about discord. Rebellion brings about disorder. And even rebellion brings about calipitals and plagues and locusts and mildew. It's right there in the text, chapter 6, 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 6. says that rebellion will bring about pestilence. And rebellion will even bring about locusts and mildew. That night, the Lord appeared before Solomon. And when Solomon, Solomon came before the Lord on behalf of the people, he was dedicating this building, this temple before the Lord, and as he delica dedicated it before the Lord, he wanted to make sure that the Lord was going to be with that nation. He wanted to make sure that the Lord would be with this people. He wanted to make sure in his prayer that he reminded God that, God, I'm looking forward to you blessing us. He says, now, Lord, if you, if you shut up heaven and there is no rain, if you command the locusts to devour the land, and if you send pestilence among the people, if they turn and look toward this temple, Lord, will you bless them? Lord, will you bless a rebellious people if they turn back to you? Lord, will you, re will you bless the people that have turned away from you? So Solomon prays this prayer, and when he prays this prayer, he wants to know if God will hear from heaven. He's saying, now, now God, I know you sit in heaven. Lord, I know you don't have to leave heaven. But Lord, while you're in heaven, will you hear from me? Let me tell you, y'all, it's a good thing when the Lord in heaven hears from us on, on planet Earth. The psalmist says in, in Psalms number eight, Psalm number eight, he says, what is man that you are mindful of him, that you have created him a little lower than the angels? that you're looking out for him, that, that man is special. And the psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, what you're thinking about man? Why, Lord, do you think so much and think so well of man? So Solomon says, Lord, if you shut down heaven, you close up heaven, if if the night appears, and will you hear our prayer, and will you cause the people to sacrifice? The Bible says as soon as he got through praying, in chapter 7 it says now, verse 1, chapter 7, 2 Chronicles, he says, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. What God does, he speaks to us, and that's why when we pray, we have to wait on God to speak to us. He says, as soon as, the text says that as soon as God 
heard from Solomon, Solomon made his request simple. He made his request known unto God. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering, consumed the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the room. God's glory filled the room. So I said to you, there's a point here where he talks about the rebellion. And rebellion brings about separation from God. Now I want to talk about the remedy. The rebellion separates us from God, but God says to Solomon in verse number 11, I have heard your prayers. He says he sees, he sees God. Uh, his heart. He, he says in verse number 12 that in the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him I have heard your prayers. It's a good thing when the Lord hear your prayer. How many of you want to just be praying just to be praying just to talk to God just to be talking to God. You see that's why we must understand that prayer is not a monologue where we talk to God and give him our grocery list. Prayer is a dialogue, and prayer is us talking to God, and God is talking to us. Oftentimes, people say, well, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. And I oftentimes ask them, well, what the answer is going to be? And the reason why I ask them what the answer is going to be, because many times when the saints of God is, are saying that they are praying unto the Lord, they already have their mind made up before the pray. I want to tell you today that prayer is a dialogue. We're talking to God, and God is talking to us. So in verse number 12 of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, God says, I've heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. God answers every prayer request that Solomon Solomon has prayed. God answers every request. He hears him, and he says that he's going to put his name there. He hears him and says he has chosen this place. He hears him and says that I will place myself for the house. He will place himself of this house of sacrifice. My question to you tonight, to the Homer Street Church, can God put his name here? Will God choose this place? Will God place himself here? You do know that churches are open, that God is nowhere to be found, right? You do know that there are churches that are open uh, that, that could just close the door and call it a country club. There are some places where they call church, they might as well call it a golf club. There are some places that are open that they call church. They may as well call it a fraternity or a sorority. Because God ought to be manifested in the house of God. You ought to be able to see him. You ought to be able to see God. You ought to be able to experience God. And, and the old folk would say, I wouldn't have a God that I couldn't feel sometimes. We ought to be able to experience God and his glory ought to fill the room in such a way until no human being can stand up to what God is doing. Verse 13 says, God is talking, God is talking, God is talking, God is talking, and he's talking and he knows that he's talking to a rebellious people that need repentance. He says, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Can you go, can you go anytime in Houston? In Houston, we, when we have a cool front come through, it's still 98 degrees. <laughs> when, when a cool front comes through Houston, boy, we, we are happy, we are glad, but it's still 98 degrees. You can, you can sweat all your clothes wet <laughs> in the middle of the summer at 98 degrees of humidity in Houston. God, if God shut up heaven where there's no rain, the ground is dry, the people are drenched, there's no rain. 
problem with many of us, we, we complain when it rains that it rains too much. When it doesn't rain, we need God to send us some rain. When it does rain, it doesn't rain enough. <laughs> God has a choice, and this points out to us today that God is a sovereign. Matter of fact, he is the sovereign God. He does what he wants to do, when he chooses to do it, to whom he chooses to do it, anytime he chooses to do it, any way he chooses to do it, because he is God. He is a sovereign God. He says, if I shut up heaven and there is no rain, if I command the locusts to divide the land, if I send pestilence among the people, God, God can do it, you know. People want to know today, has God sent COVID-19, has God sent the coronavirus all over the world? I say to you today, I don't know because I'm not smart like that. But one thing I do know, God has everybody's attention. <laughs> whether he sent it or not, whether he brought it about or not, he has everybody's attention <laughs> in this pandemic. Not only is it an epidemic where it's, it's covering a certain portion of the area, it is a pandemic where it's covering the entire globe. Let me tell you, God has our attention. Does God have your attention? There are some people that God still doesn't have their attention. God says, if I shut up heaven and there be no rain, if I command the locusts to divide the land where your crops are being eaten up, if I bring pestilence in, and some people can't even stand a fly. But if I bring pestilence throughout the land and I place them among the people, he says, I have a prescription for you. So these rebellious people has, have caused chaos. These rebellious people have caused locusts and plagues. Then he says there's a remedy. It's found in verse number 14. The remedy is if my people who are called or which are called by my name. My people who are called by my name. If my people who are called by my name. This word people means a congregated union. A tribe. A group of troops, a flock, a nation of people. If the people who are on my side, God is looking for some people who he has been able to use and he is able to use today. Some people walk away. The Bible talks about the, the, great, the great falling away from the church, apostasy, the great pushing away, the great leaving the church. Let me say to you today that, that are listening by way of, of streaming, just because you're getting comfortable not showing up at the church, <laughs> don't get too comfortable because the fact of the matter is God still wants us to come to the church. When this thing goes away, when this thing is over, when we are released from this pandemic, you ought to be running to the church house, running to the temple of God so you can celebrate what God is doing. God is calling for his people. God is calling for the people who are saved, the people who are born again. He is calling for the people who has his name. He says, if my people who are called, this word call means that are addressed by his name. This word call, those who, who have been called out. This word call, those who have been pronounced that they are God's people. You know, it's very easy for us to uh, talk about God around other saints. <laughs> it's very easy for us to talk about God in such a way that we are thrilled about it, we are impacting, we are excited, we are enthusiastic about it, as long as everybody in the group talking about God. But God wants us to be able to talk about him, to live for him in the face of other men who don't know him. You see, God wants to put us on display. God has called us out of our mess so he can give us a, a demonstration of who he is and give the world a demonstration of who he is. 
The word name means position, authority, honor. The word name means character. The word name means a good report. If my people who are called by God's good report, that are called by God's position, that, that are called by God's name, should humble themselves. Humble themselves. Humble themselves to, to bend down as if to need, to, to come to humiliation, to, to come to a point where you get low and under subjection. Humble means to sub be subdued where you place yourself under the authority of one. If my people who are called by my name would bring themselves low below God and not think so highly of yourself. I know not at this church but at other churches there are some people who feel like they are God themselves. There are some people who feel like they got a good name and they can do what they want to do and they can act in the way they want to act. But let me tell you, God has our attention now. We have to humble ourselves. We have to bring ourselves low. We have to even be, this word humble means to be humiliated sometimes. To be subservient, to to, to not think so highly of yourself. If my people, in other words, get down off your high horse, regardless of your degree, regardless of your employment, regardless of your 401k, regardless of your retirement, let me tell you, God has our attention so much now until we don't know what the next moment is going to bring. Wake up in the morning, the stock market is flying high. Before 10 a.m., the flop stock market has bottomed out lower than ever before. It doesn't matter what you drive. It doesn't matter what, what neighborhood you live in. It could be a gated or ungated community or, or no community. It doesn't matter who you are. You have to humble yourself before the almighty God. I'm talking about a prescription for healing. If we really want to be healed, we're going to have to be humbled says not only should we humble ourselves, we ought to pray. We ought to intercede for one another and intercede for ourselves. This word pray means to entreat God. It means to make supplication for God. It means to plead with God. It means that we ought to approach God in such a way till we reverence him. Jesus communicates this thought when he says, when you pray, you go to God who's in heaven and you address him as our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, your name is majestic. Lord, your name is glorious. Lord, you are God and you are God alone. If you look at chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles, that's how Solomon approached God, reminding God, telling God of who he is. Telling God how great of a God he is. So when we pray, we ought to supplicate. It's not the Lord lay me down to sleep. I, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to cake. It's not that kind of prayer. It's a supplication. It is, it is a, a dealing with some things. It is some moaning and groaning deep down within. It is prayer where you supplicate and you give your all when you're talking to the Lord. Preacher tells a story how when he went to, went to the hospital to visit with a young lady, and they had given her a few days to live, and the, the pastor and the, and the associate pastor went to the hospital. And he said that usually when they go to the hospital, they go to the hospital, they, they stand over the bed, they lay their hands on one, and they expect that person to rise up. They expect that person to be blessed by God. But on this particular occasion, when they went to the hospital, one of them unloosened his tie and the other one unloosed his tie. One of them pulled his coat off and the other one pulled his coat off. And they both bowed down beside the bed and called on God because they knew that the situation was critical and the prayer was urgent. 
when we come down off our high horse and we talk to God, we supplicate to him, we, we, we acknowledge who he is and we make sure that we call on the Lord. And for many of us, we'll be calling on him like never before. The Bible says when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he prayed until sweat dropped down like drops of blood. It's when you give yourself physically, give yourself emotionally, and give yourself spiritually before the Lord. I say to you today, don't wait till it get bad to pray like that. <laughs> You ought to have a pattern of praying like that. You ought to have a pattern of praying in such a way until before you get on your knees, before you bow your head, before you raise your head to the Lord, God already knows you because you're walking close with him and you have a great fellowship with him. That's when God answers prayer before you ask him. We ought to know God because we fellowship with him in prayer on a regular basis. So he says... Then we ought to seek his face. It says, it says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. This word seek means to thrive after. This word seek means to, to go after with great intensity. This word seek, seek means to beseech God to desire God. That's what we do when we fast, right? We're seeking God in such a way until things around us are not as important to us getting with God. When you deny some things to get in touch with God, when, when you deny some things to walk with God, when you deny some things to talk to God, then you are seeking after God. This word seek means to search out God. You, God says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, pray and seek my face. This word faith means favor. The word faith means humble, least seeking for his presence. We ought to seek the presence of God. And then this word faith comes with the idea, this word face come with the idea of, of seeking God's face, seeking his favor, seeking to please him in such a way that you look upside down and all around for God. It means to stand looking for God. It means to bow down looking for God. It means to search out God. We want to seek his favor. Let me tell you, I may not have a lot of money, but I got favor with God. And one thing I do know that even if I don't have money, I got favor with God. And because I have favor, I can get some money. And then if I have favor, I won't need money. The stuff that I need, God will bring it to me because I got favor with God. See, people worried about getting more money. You need favor with God. And when you have favor with God, when you're in his face and he's in your face, guess what? Stuff comes that you don't even imagine. That's why the text, one, one of the writers says, I think it's Paul that's, that, that says that, that, that God will bring things to you that you know not of. So he, he, he says that we must seek the face of God. He says and turn from our wicked ways. Turn means to repent. Turn means to go back. Turn means to retreat, means to stop doing what you're doing. Turn means to bring back again. Turn means to withdraw yourself from the situation. Remove yourself, remove yourself. I, I can't quote the things that daddy used to tell us, but now I understand how much sense it made. Daddy would tell you when, when you're in a fight, it's better for them to say, there he goes splitting than there he lays. And like I said, daddy, daddy wasn't preaching, so I can't quote what daddy, daddy used to say. He said, daddy said, it's better for you to walk away. It's better for you to turn away. It's better for you to retreat. It's better for you to change your mind and repent. Withdraw yourself. God says to us today that we must turn from our wicked ways. We must turn. We must leave it alone. I mean, this this sin 
body we have, this sin nature we have, regardless of how saved you are, regardless of how long you've been saved, this sin nature loves sin. It loves sin. It loves sin. It, it's attracted to sin. This sin nature we have like sin. And you can tell when a brother misses his sin. He'll tell you, oh, those were the good old days. <laughs> Oh, I just can remember it now like it was yesterday. Those were the good old days. And God says, turn away from the good old days. Turn away from sin. Run back away. Retreat from sin. He says, turn away from your wicked ways. Word wicked means bad, evil. Word wicked means adversary to the, to the Lord we serve. The word wicked gives us adversity. The word wicked gives us calamity. The word wicked means that we are mischievous. And it didn't matter, didn't matter how old we were when we were growing up. If we got too quiet, mama would ask what question? What y'all doing in there? It's because she knew that wickedness was bound in our hearts. She knew that sin nature loved to sin. But the Bible says in the text that we must turn away from our wicked doing this, our wicked conversation. The word ways means our, our road, turn away from that road. It means to turn away from our course of action. It means to turn away from our mode of action. It means to change our manner, our journey, and even our conversation. We got to even change our conversation. We can't even talk like we used to talk. We can't even act like we used to act. We can't even carry on like we used to carry on. <laughs> he says, turn away from your evil ways. If my people who are called by my name should humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I hear your prayers in heaven. Then God will allow you to get through. If you just get down off your high horse, humble yourself and pray, seek his face, turn from my wicked ways. The prescription is to make sure you do these things so you can have some results. So he says, even the rebellious ones will have good results. He says, then will I hear from heaven, and then I will forgive them of their sins. Forgive means I will pardon them. I will spare them. I will, I will, I will spare them the occasion. I will spare them the sacrifice, and I will purify them from their sins. I will clean them up, and then I will relieve them of their punishment. I told you early, mercy is when you deserve to be messed up. You deserve to be thrown away. You deserve to die. But God gives us mercy, and he spares us from a punishment of our sins. I'm so glad God spared me. You glad God spared you? I'm so glad. And, and let me tell you, it wasn't because I was so holy. It, it wasn't even because I got it always right. It wasn't because I was saved and I've been saved a long time. It's because of his grace and his mercy that he spared me one more time. He spared me one more time. If he doesn't spare me tomorrow, I'm grateful that he spared me today because I don't deserve to be here. Right about here, that's when, when you knew, used to hear a good holler that he spared me one more time. He forgave me, he spared me, he pardoned me, he relieved me of the punishment of my offenses, of my sin. And this sin that he talks about, he's talking about temporary sin, he's talking about intermittent sin, and he's talking about continuous sin. He's talking about sin that we, we make a habit out of. The little white lies we tell, the little gossiping we do. God has pardoned us because we should have been out of here. He has cleared our case. And finally, he says, I hear the lamb. 
This word heal, healing, this word heal means that he will mend it by stitching it together. He will mend it. Do, does our land need to be healed? Does our nation need to be healed? Are we suffering from anything? We're messed up and, and we're rebellious. We need a remedy. The remedy is that we need to search out and seek out God, pray to him. It says he will mend, he will heal it, he will mend it, he will stitch it, he will sew it back together as a physician does to a broken wound. He'll sew it back together. He'll put it together. He was, this word land means that he will sew the land back together. He will sew the country back together. And let me tell you, if you're living in these great United States of America, I want to remind you, you're living in the greatest nation in all the world. But it's because of rebellion. It's because we need a remedy. It's because we've turned away from God. It's because God is looking to shut up heaven. But if he shuts up heaven, I thank God that we can have results. It says that he will mend it back together. He will sew it back together. He will heal the land. This word heal is a holistic healing. It's a, it's a healing in your mind, healing in your soul, healing in your body. It is a holistic healing. And not only he will heal you, he will heal the entire country. Finally, verse number 15. He says, then and only then, now my eyes shall be open and mine ears attend to the prayers that is made in this place. We want God to hear our prayers. God is present. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. God is calling us to righteousness. God is blessing us for our faithfulness. And God loves his people. He loves his people so much until even today he has given us a way to get away from our rebellion. He has given us a remedy for our sin. He has given us results that we have and we are enjoying every day. He did it over 2,000 years ago. He took Jesus and he made Jesus the Christ the remedy for our rebellion. He made Jesus the Christ. He gave his only begotten son, his son, Jesus, the only, the only unique son, his, his son, Jesus, his only begotten son, his only one-of-a-kind son, he gave Jesus for you and for me. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. There were three crosses on that hill. There were three men on the hill. One man died in sin. The other man died from sin, and the other man died for sin. And the man in the middle, Jesus himself, he died on a skull hill called Calvary. They took him off the cross. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He is the remedy for our sin. He is the remedy for our rebellion. He is the remedy for our chaos, Jesus the Christ himself. And you may be listening to me today. I want to suggest to you to try Jesus. You tried Shaquita. You tried Joanne. You tried Tyrone, you tried Joel, I want you to try Jesus. For if you try Jesus, you won't be dissatisfied. Jesus of Christ is the remedy for all our sin. You see, because we are saved, it doesn't matter if we, are, we think we are all that or not. We are not saved because we are good. We are saved because he is good. The writer says, for he is good. The writer says, for his mercy endureth forever. Unto all generations, the Lord Jesus Christ has made a way for us to get to heaven when we die. And it's nothing that we bring to the table. We, we are saved by grace through faith. Now, first of all, the grace is not ours because it belongs to God. Secondly, the faith is not ours, for God has given unto every man a measure of faith. 
So God brought that to the table. Only thing we can bring is a humble heart and allow God to save our souls. I was teaching the other day in seminary, and the lady was telling me that, you know, I don't have the testimony that some of you people, she, she might as well have said some of you bad people have. She said, I don't have the testimony where God had to knock me off my beast and, and shake me up. I don't have that testimony. I had to remind her, it's not because you've been so good that you're saved. It's because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. He died a substitutionary death for you and for me. He died a voluntary death for you and for me. He is the prescription. Here is the prescription for our healing. Our sin-sick souls can be mended only through receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. I submit to you today to receive Jesus as your Savior. I submit to you just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb, and that he rose from the dead. If you would, just join me in this simple prayer and invite him into your life, and he will make you whole. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. We believe if you believe the story of Jesus, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you prayed this prayer to, to invite him into your life. We believe that you're born again. We believe that when you die, you're on your way to heaven. We believe that you have secured a spot in heaven through Jesus Christ, for he is the only way to get there. Let me again thank the New Beginning Church for, for allowing me to be here and thank the Holman Street Church for inviting me here. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. Let's go to, to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you now and we bless your name. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we thank you that you are the merciful God. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are, able, you are enabling us to be faithful unto you. We thank you, Lord, that if we turn from our ways, we thank you, Lord, that if we pray, we thank you, Lord God, that, that if we just hear your voice and, and obey your voice, we can be made the better. We thank you now, and this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. For those of you who are watching, please go to holmanstreet.org, holmanstreet.org. Give your offering. This is a good night, a good time for offering time. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.